Good morning, Mountain View. Y'all are so well behaved. I'm still going to give you another minute, but uh, you've you've already found your seats. You're already where you're supposed to be, uh, when you're supposed to be there, uh, which is more than could be said about USC's defense yesterday in the fourth quarter. Y'all SC Trojan fans, you, you were probably worried about Coach Prime. It was uh, it was quite an experience to watch that yesterday, but uh, that is a spiritual experience for some, and uh, for others, the spiritual experience happens through the killers to each their own. I'll choose college football. Uh, just the other day, uh, we were at a yard sale. It's not really a, an easy way to transition into this story. Just the other day, we were at a yard sale, and uh, at this yard sale, our whole family was at different tables looking at different things, and our kids picked up this black, rectangular, uh, plastic piece of something that they did not know what it was with two holes in it, and they said, Dad, what is this? And it was at that point that I knew I'm getting old. Not because I knew that this was a cassette tape, but because of what came out of my mouth in explaining what this cassette tape was. The the words that came out were just so natural. They came out so quickly and so confidently that I said to the kids, well, kids, back in our day, and that's when I knew I'm, I'm getting old. Because I said, back in our day, that's how we listen to music. And we use this phrase, back in our day, to explain a time that was different, the previous time from the current time that we're in, that we had a different experience to kind of frame this reality for them that they've never experienced for themselves. And so I, I said, well, back in our day, that's how we listen to music. Because in their day today, if they want to listen to any song, if they want to listen to any artist from any genre in any decade of musical history, all they have to do is go to Apple Music, and they can instantaneously listen to the song that they want to hear. For us, back in our day, we had to go to the store to buy a cassette tape to take home to put into our boombox We had to find the right side that the song was on, side A or side B, right? Y'all are with me on this? And and if the cassette tape wasn't fully operational, you had to stick your pinky finger in there and kind of tighten up the tape a little. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Help me out here. Then you get your your tape into the boom box. You you get the boom box ready to play, rewind it to the song that you want to listen to, push play, and then rock out. That's how we had to do music back in our day. For kids, for our kids today, if, if they want to learn something new, if they have a question about something, they go and ask Alexa, or they can Google it, or they can simply go to a YouTube university class. Back in our day, if we have a question about a topic, if we're wondering about something that's happening in the world, we go and ask a teacher back in our day, And what would the teacher say? Oh, go and read a book about it. And then you got to like go to the library, hope you remember your library card. You got to recall the Dewey Decimal System and and hope that you remember how to find the book that you're looking for so that you can check out this said book and then go and put it on your nightstand where it's unread for the next two weeks before you have to return to the library. You know what I'm talking about? For our kids today, if they want to order something, if they need something, whether that's food, groceries, whether that's uh, something from the store, it's as easy as going onto the app Instacart. And they can order something or go on to Amazon Prime. They don't even have to go onto an app. They can just simply use their voice today to say, Alexa, order toilet paper. And within two hours, A 12-pack of Charmin arrives, courtesy of Amazon Prime. Now, for those of you who are watching online, you're welcome, because I just ordered you a 12-pack of Charmin that'll be on your front door in two hours. But things have changed since the good old days. But the good old days is something we regularly look back to time and time again to refer back to something that has changed 
from the way that it is now. We do this and we, we kind of reminisce about the good old days, but if we're being honest, if we're being transparent, do we really want to go back to the good old days? Because things are kind of nice right now. It's kind of nice that we can just click something and it'll show up on our doorstep in a couple of hours. I, I remember when Amazon first came out, uh, Amazon was this website run out of Jeff Bezos' garage. Now, Jeff has since done really well for himself since the good old days. But I remember thinking, who in the world would order a book on a website when you could go and drive to the bookstore and find any book that you wanted as long as it was in stock? Now our kids have no category for this because every book that they've ever gotten has come from Amazon. The reason that, that I talk about all of this is because we live in a world that's changing. Our culture is changing. Government and politics is always changing. Generation after generation, experiences change. But what we need to know as followers of Christ is change is inevitable. It's coming. It's happening. Change is always going to be occurring all around us, everywhere we can see from generation to generation. Change is inevitable, but irrelevance isn't. Yes, change even happens in the church world. Yes, change even happens in local church context. But for our churches, for our church here at Mountain View, irrelevance doesn't have to happen. Irrelevance in the local church, regardless of what people may think or what people may understand about the local church, we don't have to be irrelevant. Because yes, while things change, it doesn't mean we have to become irrelevant in the process. Now, uh, people in uh, all throughout biblical history walked through change. God's people were consistently and continually uh, navigating change in their culture, in their day, throughout their part of history. And we can see it so clearly in the pages of Scripture that I want us to walk through this together today. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn over to Judges chapter 2. And in Judges chapter 2, we're picking up the story of God's people in the midst of great change. Now, as you're turning over to Judges chapter 2, let me just tell you that nobody's going to judge you if you need to look at the table of contents to find the book of Judges. Uh, Some of you, uh, you hear this and you didn't know that there was a book in the Bible called Judges, and you're like, I knew it. I knew Christians were judgy people. But this is a story that has nothing to do with being judgmental, and everything to do with God being faithful. It's all about the faithfulness of God in an ever-changing, ever-uncomfortable moment in the history of the people of God. As we pick up in the story, uh, the people of God were in the thick of it. They had experienced seasons of, of great Seasons of plenty, seasons of health and prosperity, seasons of thriving, but these seasons of goodness had come on the the heels of seasons of oppression and slavery and injustice, pressures from all sides. The people of Israel had experienced both the good and the bad, the difficult along with the blessing of God. And they had gone through all of this difficulty at the hands of the Egyptians, uh, the Egyptians who had enslaved them. But God rose up a leader in this moment, in this point in history, to bring the change for the people of Israel that they so desperately needed. Now, this was a change that came at the hands of a leader named Moses. And Moses led God's people out of this chapter of slavery, of abuse, of hunger, and strife. Because God made a promise to his people. 
God made this promise to his people, and he said, I see your pain. I see your abuse. I see what you're walking through in your life that's difficult right now. God saw it and made a promise to rescue them. And he said, I'm going to get you out of there. But this is not where the promise of God ended for the people of God. God's promise doesn't end in the early pages of Scripture. God's promise doesn't end in rescue. God's promise goes on to our thriving in our life. And somebody needs to hear that this morning, that God doesn't just rescue us out of something. God rescues us for something. God rescues us for thriving in our life. And his promise goes on to thriving. And God's promise is not a promise that was reserved for ancient days. God's promise isn't just for stories in Scripture. God's promise extends to your story and my story today, right now. Because God is still making promises, and he is still keeping promises. It's who God is. And God's promises for our life aren't something that bring pain to our life. God's promises for our life aren't something that, that remove and extract all pleasure from our life. No, God's promise is for our good. It's why the prophet Jeremiah said, uh, from speaking from God, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for your good to prosper you, not to harm you. It's why when God made a promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, he fulfilled that promise, and he shows us he fulfills that promise through Abraham's thriving. It's why God makes a promise to Noah after the flood. It's why God makes a promise to his people time and time again, because it's who God is. He is a promise-making and promise-keeping God. And in this moment in their history, God had promised a rescue. God had promised that he would rescue them from the oppression and lead them to a land of possession. And God promised that in this land, his people would have everything that they needed to thrive. They would have everything they needed to thrive physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. God promised that they would have every need met, which is good news for us today because our Heavenly Father provides more than just for the religious aspects of our life. God isn't just interested in the eternal portions of our life. No, he is interested in the here and now today. And a leader in that day named Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land. Now, Joshua was a guy who took the Israelites to the banks of the Jordan River. He showed them the promised land that God had prepared. He led them into this new season of life, a season of thriving. Joshua didn't just show them the land, he led them to it. He didn't just wax poetic. No, he followed through on what God was doing. And these are the leaders that are worth following. Leaders and leadership is not just about casting vision. It's not just about talking about great things. No, leadership is about doing great things. Leadership is about becoming the type of person who is worth following. Vision inspires, but direction, discipline toward that is what God uses to accomplish his visions. But there came a point in the life of Joshua, a point that comes in our life, each and every one of us, that at some point our life will come to an end. And that's where we pick up with the story at the end of Joshua's life in Judges chapter 2, verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in the Timnath Harries, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. And all that generation 
also were gathered to their fathers. Generations passed. You have the, the wandering generation, the generation in the wilderness uh, with Moses. You have the conquering generation under Joshua who conquered and saw the Lord's victory displayed in their own people. These generations had both been eyewitnesses of God's great signs and wonders to save and deliver his people. And then we get to Joshua chapter 2, verse 10, and it says those generations died too, just like the other ones. But then watch this in Judges 2, 10, the second half of this verse, and all that, that generation were also gathered to their fathers. It's another way of saying they died too. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. This was one generation removed from all of the incredible things that God had done. This is just one generation. We're not talking thousands of years here. One generation removed. And it says that they did not know the Lord. Don't forget, these are the generations that saw the waters of the Red Sea parted. This is the generation that saw food, literal food from heaven, fall in provision for their daily needs. This was the generation that saw other countries rise up to try to defeat them time and time again. Stronger, bolder, better warriors than them would rise up against them. And time and time again, God would continue to provide victory for his people. And yet it says right here, that the very next generation did not know God. They didn't know who God was. They didn't know what God had done. They didn't know how God had provided in generation after generation. This next generation did not know that he had miraculously provided for everything they need. What a tragic sequel to the triumphant story of Joshua. But God was not done. He was not done with his people then. And he is not done making and keeping promises for us today. The outcome of the story was not based on the faithfulness of Joshua. The outcome of our story, the outcome of your story today is not based on your faithfulness. It's based on the faithfulness and the goodness of God himself which is great news for us today because God is continuing to work in and through us in spite of us. Whether we're faithful or not, whether Joshua was faithful or not, and we are going to see that God's people were not faithful at all times, and yet they were still God's people in every moment in history. And God worked in this generation with this group of people, like I am hoping and praying that God will work through our generation. What God did in those days, I'm hoping and praying that God will do in our days. The prophet Habakkuk captured it this way in Habakkuk chapter three. It says this, I have heard all about you, Lord. I've heard report of you and your work do I fear. In the midst of these years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Eugene Peterson, the the writer of the message, translation of scripture, captures it this way. God, I have heard what our ancestors say about you, and I am stopped in my tracks, down on my knees. Do among us what you did among them. Work among us as you've worked among them. This is our prayer that God would move in incredible ways in our generation, in our community, in our church here at Mountain View. Uh, Since we've arrived here, our hope and our desire has been to do three things. We've, We've wanted to do a whole lot of listening, a whole lot of learning. God, what have you done in the past? How have you used your church here at Mountain View? What's God done in our community? What's God done among our people? What has God done here in the context of Mountain View Church? We wanted to become students of our community so that we could learn 
And what, what, we've, what we've done is we've done listening and, and learning is we've come to deeply love our community here at Mountain View. We've fallen in love with what God has done and what God is going to continue to do. And today we are begging and crying out to God, God, would you move like you have in days past? God, we want you to work in our day, today, and the days ahead, just like you have in the days past. God, what you did miraculously in their day, we're asking and begging that you would do it in our day. You've worked generation after generation, across families, across centuries, and we are stopped in our tracks. God, you have never failed us yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, God. And our confidence is that, Jesus, you are still enough. We've seen you move mountains. Would you do it again? We've seen you make a way when there's no way, and we believe that you're going to do it again. This is all based on the faithfulness and the goodness and the kindness of God. Our confidence is in him and in him alone. God raised up this generation, and then he raised up another generation. He raised up generation after generation who stood on his promises, but we got to know this. It took people stepping out. It took people stepping up, making a change, and taking a risk. One of the questions that I got all throughout the interview process was, Pastor, what's going to change at Mountain View Church now that you're the pastor? Uh, some people didn't approach it with questions. They approached it with, hey, this better not change when you come. Uh, some people uh, approached it with, hey, you've got to change this. I mean, it's, in, it's an impossible situation to be in, but I want us to answer that question today. What's going to change at Mountain View? Uh, because I think that's a question that's a natural question that's on a lot of people's hearts and minds. And so I want to answer the question, what's going to change, with this. Not a lot. And everything. Some things won't change and other things will. And here's why I answer it this way. Because of this, because methods may change, but our mission and our message will never change. The methods that we use to accomplish the mission that God has called us to, those methods may change. They should change. They ought to change because there are things in our culture that change. Uh, the methods may change, but the timeless message of God's truth in Scripture will never change. And we will stand unapologetically on the truth of Scripture, not some idea or some method that may have worked in the past. We will stand for God's truth today. Because timeless truths are always timely in any culture, in any day of history. The principles never change. Plans and programs may change because the, the plans and the programs that may have worked in the past may not work now, but the principles that we stand on, the gospel that we proclaim and that we preach and that we practice never changes. Now, we've said it time and time again, the truths of scripture aren't here so that we can say, oh, good for them. No, these truths are great for us. The timeless truths are always timely. This is the greatest story ever written. It's not just about ancient history. It's, this is a living truth. And when we open this book to tell the greatest story ever written in the gospel, when we open this book, we're not making it relevant. We're just reminded that it already is relevant in our day today. And so we have a commitment that's our conviction that we're going to stand for the truth of Scripture. Listen, there are, there are entire generations today uh, of people, of kids who have not grown up in the church right here in South Orange County. There are people who don't even have a, a copy of Scripture in their home. 
And this foundation of truth is not even in our societal fiber anymore. And so we are going to stand as a church committed convictionally on the truth of God. And at the same time, we're going to have an unwavering commitment to reach people with the good news. And what that means is we're going to do whatever it takes to reach one more person for Jesus. But all around the room today, there are chairs just like this. The chairs that you are sitting in. The chairs that you sit in on a weekly basis. And over these last several months, we've seen God do incredible things in these chairs as we've welcomed more kids for Vacation Bible School than we ever have at Mountain View before. God's done incredible things right here uh, in these chairs as he's growing a thriving kids ministry, as we're launching new small groups. As we're, we've seen in the past few weeks, God's mobilized over a quarter of our entire church family to step up and serve and volunteer. And yet there's room to grow. As you look around, yes, you're seated in a chair like this, but as you look around, there are chairs with no one seated in it, which means there is somebody that needs to sit in this chair next to you. There's somebody you know who needs the hope that you have, a hope that comes from the church because we have the only hope that really matters. There's somebody that you know who needs the community that you found as you come and gather in these chairs. There are people who don't feel like they have a place to sit in a chair like this, in a church like this. But we're going to be passionate about reaching people who are far from Christ and far from the local church to the hope that's only found in Jesus and the community that's found in this church family. But it's going to take some change. If we're going to reach this generation, it's going to take some change. Uh, now, as an aside, if you're, if you're worshiping a God who never offends you, who never expects anything out of you, who never wants you to change, let me just say you are not worshiping the true and living God, but rather you're worshiping an idol that you've formed by your own opinions and your own preferences and then attached the name of Jesus to that. And so it's going to take some change for us to be able to reach the people that God is calling us to reach. Because this isn't just about us. We imagine a church that our kids and our grandkids will want to come to. We want to be the church that our friends love to attend. We want to be a place at Mountain View where people who don't feel welcome today will feel welcome tomorrow. Because we're a home for the wanderer to find a place to belong. This is a house of belonging. Because we find rest in the new and the redeemed identity of Jesus. Because we love Jesus and we love the world for which he died. We have a passion for those who don't yet know Christ, and our old methods may not be optimally suited to help us to accomplish our unchanging mission. We are a place and a people, diverse in calling, but unified in purpose, partnering with God to advance his kingdom here on earth, in the renewal of all things. And God is always faithful. And we are going to do whatever we can to reach one more person for Jesus. And so we're creating an experience for people who may not even be here yet, who haven't attended. So that means that it may make those of us who are already here a bit uncomfortable at times but we're going to continue to dig deep in Scripture so that people who've been following Jesus for decades, uh, people who know Scripture inside and out, will have a place where God is working in their life through his truth from the Word. But we're not going to do it in a way that 
loses the people who don't speak Christianese. We're going to be intentional about crafting musical worship experiences that engage people exactly where they're at instead of expecting them to be somewhere they're not. We're going to create a safe place for people to belong wherever they're at, wherever they've been, and whatever has happened to them, a safe place where it's okay to show up with the hurts in your life, with the habits that are part of who we are, with the hang-ups that we just can't seem to get beyond, with the unmet hopes and expectations and dreams that we have, and we find healing in Jesus through our rest- restoration ministry. This will be a house that's a safe place to engage in discussions with doubts that you may have, a place that's safe to be honest about the struggles that you're carrying. We want to create a safe space and a safe place of grace where we see the best in people and where we extend grace to the people that others may ignore. There's no doubt in my mind that there are hurts that you've brought into this room. Some of you this morning are, are wearing a mask as you come into church, and I'm not talking about the N95 mask. I'm talking about uh, this mask that covers some of the hurts that you're carrying that are very real in your life. For some of you this morning, your, your marriage is, it just feels like it's fallen apart. For some of you this morning who are in the room, you may not be able to make your mortgage payment or your rent You're struggling with a health concern, whether that's you or someone in your family. You have kids that are making choices that you may not agree with. And my hope and my dream for this place is that we are a people, that this house is a space where people can be authentic. They're not afraid to be real, that we as a church family can get to know someone's story and to listen to people and hear their concerns, their fears, their issues, and to love them in spite of whatever that is. And it's not just important that that we do that here. It's important that we do it out there. Far be it from us to be the generation that dies knowing Jesus, but leaves the next generation confused. Far be it from us to be a people who are passionate about making a point. May we be a people who are passionate about making a difference in our world. Now, the way forward isn't difficult. It's not like overcomplicated. It's not even controversial, but there will be moments that are hard. But in it, we're fiercely committed to Jesus, and we're fiercely committed to his truth. What may be difficult for some is giving up the comfort that you've grown accustomed to. But I want to challenge you. I want to press into you in this moment that it's time we get uncomfortable as a church so that others can find comfort in the gospel. If in your mind you think that being a Jesus follower is all about being easy and and comfortable— We've got to reframe that idea around the gospel and square it with Scripture. Because when I see comfort talked about in Scripture, I see that Jesus comforts the shaken and he shakes up the comfortable. And so, church, it's time we get get uncomfortable so that those who don't know Christ can find the comfort of Christ. Uh, The Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 The leaders of the early church prayed together. They decided together that they would not make it difficult on the Gentile believers. They got uncomfortable. They gave up their traditions so that they could welcome the outsiders. And I can tell you, in this change and in what may feel like it's uncomfortable, you're not going to get left behind. You won't be forgotten or abandoned. We want to invite you into what God is doing and who he's reaching. Where we're headed at Mountain View isn't new. It's not original with me. It's actually hidden in plain sight in the Gospels and in the New Testament. We know it will work because it's already worked for centuries before us. Because once upon a time, members of a first century group known as the Way against all odds, 
captured the attention and ultimately the dedication of a pagan world, both inside and outside the Roman Empire, because Jesus introduced change. Jesus brought something new. And the new that Jesus introduced stood in stark and blatant, unambiguous contrast to the values and assumptions of the culture and the establishment. And for the last 2,000 years, despite how tragic the sequel has seemed, God has raised up leaders to bring the change needed to change lives of those who needed it. I grew up in Tennessee, and I grew up in a very close, tight-knit family. Uh, All of my aunts and uncles, cousins, all of our family kind of lived close in Tennessee, and my grandmother lived just down the street from us. And so for, for my grandmother, I, I did all of the little handyman work and I mowed her lawn. I would take out her trash and always stop by her house to, to help out in whatever way that I could. There were some days where uh, there was nothing that needed to be done, but I would just go and show up to sit and be with my grandmother who we had a, a very close relationship, uh, she and I. I don't know that grandma had favorites, but what I do know is I was her favorite. (laughs) And so I would show up and just sit and talk and be with her. And every time, without fail, grandma would say, honey, go get yourself something to eat. Go get yourself something to drink. Grandma lived alone, but she cooked for the masses. And every time I was over at my grandmother's house, she had my favorite soda on planet Earth. She had in her refrigerator, icy cold, a Stewart's orange cream soda. The delicious, very hard to find soda, because this soda is not in every grocery store. It's not in every store that you walk into. But my grandmother knew I loved it. And so she went looking for it so that she could have it ready in her refrigerator every time I came over. She wasn't always sure when I would come over. She didn't always know how long I would stay when I did come over. But she was always ready with an orange cream soda waiting for me in her refrigerator. And this is the kind of church we're going to become. You have friends that you're inviting you have family, you have neighbors and coworkers that you have been praying for and leaning in, hoping and wishing that they would come to church with you. And here's a promise and a commitment that I'll make to you. We are stocking the fridge of Mountain View Church full of the orange soda. Because while we don't know when your friend or when your family is going to come, we don't know how long they'll be here but we'll be ready. We will be ready when they do come with a clear, simple, relevant message that is founded on the truth of the gospel. We will be ready with engaging worship when they're here. We'll be ready with ministries and opportunities for them to connect, not in a program, but in a process of what God can do in their life. I really believe that the best days of our church are ahead. I really believe that God is not done with our church. And so, I don't want you to miss out. I don't want you to miss everything that God is doing here. So will you join us? Will you stack hands with us as we together say, let's do whatever it takes to reach one more person for Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we are we're humbled as we're reminded that you invite us into what you're doing. And so God, in these days ahead, would you would you unite us together so that we can do whatever it takes for someone to hear about the hope of Jesus. God, would you Would you show us the people that you want us to bring? Would you begin to open doors of opportunity for us to invite? And would we together as a community 
passionately pursue what you have for your church. Lord, would you do it again? Would you do it here at Mountain View? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.